Good to have everybody here tonight. Looks like uh, we've got a, a good sized crowd. Uh, that's exciting for me because um, this is what I love to teach more than anything else. My favorite thing to do in the office. So I want to note here on the first screen, uh, this is my email address. And you're welcome to email me uh, questions you may have after the program, uh, if I don't answer them during the program. And I will do my best within the next day or two to get back to you um, to make sure we are clear on anything uh, I may have run over or not explained well. So here we go. A uh, little bit about me, um, just my bio stuff and people probably don't care about, um, but that's kind of who I am, what I do for the last 25 years. And this picture is of downtown Denver and behind that tree, that tall 40 story building is where I've practiced for the last 21 years. As I get into this program and we start talking about uh, porcelain veneers, um, I wanna credit these three guys uh, for teaching me much of what I'll be sharing with you tonight. So Dr. Nash and Dr. Rosenthal have uh, been my mentors uh, since really I, I started doing this 25 years ago. Uh, so much of what I've learned about porcelain veneers are things that Ross and Larry have taught me over the years. Many of the things I'll share with you tonight are things that these two guys shared with me um, many years ago, but it's still, uh, it's consistent, it's appropriate, uh, and it's very predictable. Uh, one of the reasons I'm very comfortable presenting this kind of material is for the last 25 years, I've been placing literally thousands, if not 10,000 worth of veneers um, in a very similar manner that's been very predictable. And the clinical success rate that I've experienced um, has been very good. And I think it's in large part because I've taken these ideas that Dr. Nasser and Dr. Rosenthal taught me years ago, and I've applied them, I've upgraded them uh, as our materials have changed and as, as I've become better. Uh, but the base of much of what I'm gonna show you tonight are, are things that Ross and Larry taught me many years ago. And then lastly, Dr. Jackson, uh, I credit for being my mentor in uh, the area of bonding more than anybody else that I ever studied under. Uh, Ron taught me so much that is still uh, applicable today. And even as our bonding agents change uh, over time, there's still the concepts um, have not changed. And many of the basic principles that Dr. Jackson taught me 20 years ago still apply today. Uh, and I'll be, I'll be sharing a lot of those principles as we go through tonight. And then the other thing I want to share with you guys tonight is uh, you are watching this program through Catapult Education. Uh, Catapult Education is certainly far more than just me. Um, many, many excellent um, experts in many different fields of dentistry uh, participate and contribute to Catapult Education. And there's a wide variety of education available, uh, much of it free if you go to catapulteducation.com. Uh, if you're looking for so many different things in dentistry to learn uh, good concepts from experts in the field, it is a great resource uh, for all dentists out there, not only throughout the US, but throughout the world. And I'd encourage you to use this resource uh, when you're trying to learn new things or trying to perfect uh, things that you're doing in the office now and just want to get better. So thank you to all the folks at Catapult Education for putting this on. Okay, so to get started and I'm gonna keep an eye on my clock and try to stay on time and try to finish so that we've got time to go through questions. So tonight I've limited the scope of what we're going to do to the steps the appropriate steps for the consistent, predictable delivery of porcelain veneers. And if you dissect these steps down, there's really these seven steps that you need to follow and be meticulous at each seven to be successful and be consistent with the placement of porcelain veneers. 
So we're going to go through these one at a time in a whole lot of detail. Because I want to be sure skipping any one of these steps or missing the detail in any one of these steps can potentially lead to failure, if not short-term failure, potentially long-term failure. But one of the benefits of being old is watching your mistakes over the years and seeing what happens when you didn't do something correctly. Uh, and as many veneers as I've placed over the years, I have certainly seen some that I did not place correctly. And I've learned from those mistakes and I try to refine my protocol to eliminate those mistakes as much as we can so that our predictability and our longevity is going to be as long as possible uh, for each patient. So we're gonna walk into this course, assuming a patient just walked through the door, they've got the temporary veneers on, we've got the veneers back from the lab, they're laid out in the operatory, we've gotten the patient numb, and we're starting at that point. So we have the patient anesthetized, first thing we're gonna do is get the temporary veneers off there. Um, oftentimes I can just pop them off with a sickle scaler. Sometimes if the retention's too good, I need to section with a handpiece and a burr. If you are gonna section, please be very careful. I usually start in the interproximal area and I will use a 12 or 16 fluted carbide burr. The reason for that is a 12 or 16 fluted carbide burr will easily cut temporary material, but it is very hard to damage actual tooth structure. And if you cut in the interproximal area, that's going to be the weak point of where your temporaries are. And then it's pretty easy to flick those pieces out now once you gain access with your sickle scaler to be able to engage the temporaries and remove them from the tooth. So on the top left screen, that's a picture of temporaries that have been in place for three weeks. And then on the right screen is just showing the sickle scaler where I try to engage it first. Usually right on top of the papilla, you can engage the sickle scaler. You can get a purchase point and you can start flicking, popping uh, pieces of the temporary off. Uh, typically, if you've done a good job with the temporaries, it doesn't come off in one piece. It comes off in a lot of little pieces. Um, and they'll be flying all over the operatory. But if I can get them all off with a sickle scaler, that minimizes any chance of me damaging the tooth with a handpiece. So I always try the sickle scaler first. Okay, now we've got all the temporaries removed and we've exposed the preps and then we're gonna go through the steps now. What do you do after you remove the temporaries? So the first thing we need to do is to clean the prepared tooth surface. And as we're cleaning it, we're looking for any excess temporary material that would interfere with the seating of the permanent veneers. So we're gonna be meticulous in the cleaning of the preps, but also while we're doing that, we're looking to see if there's small pieces of temporary material still holding on to the tooth structure. So once we've removed all the temporary material, now we need to clean the tooth before we try in the veneers. What I like to do when I'm cleaning the tooth structure is I like to use a slurry of pumice. So just plain pumice, not the profi paste that the hygienists are using to clean teeth, but just plain pumice in a profi cup. And the one thing I do a little bit different from what many people do is instead of adding water to create a slurry of the pumice, I actually use this material in the center of your screen called hemocele inside. And the liquid portion of this material is based on chlorohexidine. And that's gonna help in a number of ways as I clean the teeth. So previously, and one of the ways that Dr. Nash taught me many years ago, was using a slurry of pumice, just putting water into that profi cup that has the plain pumice in it. Well, now I've replaced the water with the hermoseal inside. A couple of reasons for doing that is 
The hermosyl inside, let me go forward on this, because it has chlorhexidine, has an antimicrobial activity to it. Many of you have noticed, and I'm sure you've heard your patients say, when you remove a temporary, how it tastes bad or smells bad. Well, that's bacteria that's accumulated underneath the temporary over time. By having the chlorhexidine in the pumice as we're cleaning, we're also disinfecting the area with the chlorhexidine and having some effect on the bacteria that's present and hopefully reducing the bacterial load, bacterial count, in the area that we're working. Also, this material has a desensitizing effect. So even though there isn't a lot of sensitivity associated with veneers, if we have an opportunity to reduce the amount of sensitivity, why wouldn't we? So another reason for using the material. Uh, some people have used Gluma for this purpose. And you certainly could do that. And Gluma does have that desensitizing effect as well. However, Gluma can be very caustic to soft tissue. And because we're using a slow speed and a profi cup, we're going to be slinging that material around the mouth. Uh, so personally, I prefer not to have glutaraldehyde being sprayed all over the oral cavity, um, just to be on the safe side. And uh, there is some research showing that the use of hermosyl inside on a tooth preparation before bonding can potentially increase the bond strength. So if that opportunity is there, why not take advantage of it? So I'm going to try to back up a slide. Nope, didn't get there. Okay, so backing up here um, and just reviewing the cleaning process, before you try on the veneers, you have to be sure that the tooth is clean, all temporary materials removed, bonding agents re to removed, any pellicle that's been picked up in the temporaries over time, that has been removed. Because anything that's in there can interfere with the seat of the veneer, but it can also interfere with the chemistry involved with the bonding as you go to put the veneer to place. Okay, we're still not ready to try in the veneers. Okay, when you take the veneer temporaries off, frequently you're gonna have some soft tissue that's irritated, potentially bleeding, you need to take care of that because ultimately you're bonding the porcelain to the tooth structure. There's no retention and resistance form um, with a veneer. It's not like a crown. All of your retention is going to be through the mechanical and chemical bonding that happens when you bond with your cement to the tooth. And any intraoral fluids or blood that's on the tooth during the bonding process will decrease the bond strength. So we've got to go back now and look at the soft tissue and control any fluid or blood that's coming from the cervical area that could get it onto the, preparated, the prepared part of the tooth that we're going to be bonding cementing to. Okay, so any number of different ways to do that. And sometimes I'll use all four of these processes. It all depends on the particular situation. But you need to have all these tools in your toolbox when you're getting ready to deliver veneers. So certainly hemostatic solutions. Uh, the one I use most frequently is Vis Viscostat Clear, which is an Ultradent product. And the clear part is very important. Um, when we're going to use a hemostatic agent, we do not want to use the ferric-based um, hemostatic solution. So the regular viscostat is ferric-based. That iron that's part of the hemostatic solution, will you'll get some iron precipitate on the tooth, and that can eventually stain over time. Okay, so we don't want that contaminating the area we're bonding to. Viscostat and every hemostatic agent I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes are all aluminous based. And aluminous based materials do not oxidize. Well, they may oxidize, but they don't oxidize as a dark precipitate. 
whereas iron-based ones will. So very important in your hemostatic agents that you're going to be using to control bleeding on the anterior work is you want aluminous-based products. So that's Viscostat Clear if you're going to use a solution for um, controlling fluid leakage in the area you're going to be cementing. So this is certainly one of the biggest tools in my toolbox when I'm getting ready to deliver veneers. Okay, the other option, or can be used in combination, is using retraction cord. Now, this is the ultra pack material. Again, this is an ultra product. And I can use this by itself or in combination with the viscous fat to control the hemorrhage. But these products over here, if you can see my pointer in the blue bottle, those are impregnated with a fair base material. These potentially could um, create a precipitate underneath your veneer that will turn dark over time and that will show through in your veneer. So these over here, you don't want to use. Okay, these plain cords over here in the white bottles, those all work great. And I do use those frequently and most often I'm using double zero or zero. Now, what I like to use most often, um, well, most often Viscostat Clear, because if it's just a little bit of hemorrhage here and there, uh, that usually will take care of the problem for me. If I've got a little more hemorrhage happening and the tissue is a little more irritated, now I go to these hemostatic pace. And there's three different examples on here. There's a few different on the market, but these are the major ones that most people use. So the Traxident, the Exposil, and the 3M retraction paste. Uh, all of these worked well. I've used all of them. Um, they're great for using with veneers. Uh, they are, all these pastes are luminous based, not ferric based, so you don't have to worry about uh, the dark precipitate um, happening underneath when you rinse it out. And then recently, Exposil, which used to be in this delivery system, uh, has introduced unidose carpules. Uh, Exposil was the first product of its type, probably came out 15, 20 years ago. Up until very recently, you've had to have this special handle and you had these local anesthetic type cartridges that you would load into this. Now, this is like a composite carpule and it loads into a traditional composite gun. Very simple to use, it's unidose. Um, some of you that used Exposil in the past, we used to have some challenges with the material drying out in storage. Uh, now with these unidose packaging, that drying out problem is non-existent. So another tool in the toolbox, have some sort of uh, hemostatic paste. So whether it's the Exposil, Traxident, the 3M product, or the others that are out there, it uh, doesn't really matter to me which one, I just want you to have it handy because even though retraction cord works, if you're trying to put retraction cord around tissue that's been irritated during the temporary phase, sometimes the, um, the mechanical trauma of placing the retraction cord can cause the bleeding to be worse and not get better. Whereas retraction paste, uh, you don't have that mechanical irritation on tissue that's already irritated. So frequently, I would say more than 50% of the time, when we deliver veneers, we're using some sort of hemostatic paste. So if you're doing veneers, anterior all ceramic crowns, highly encourage you to have some sort of hemostatic paste available. Okay, so now, just going through the steps, we've removed the veneers, we've cleaned the preps, and we've gotten the soft tissue under control. So the next thing we wanna do is get the, get the veneers in hand and try them on the teeth. So we like to use try and paste. Some people use water back in my early days of working with Dr. Nash, we would try in with water. Uh, over the years, I've found try and paste works a whole lot better for me. And 
the Tram paste not only if you're using cement to alter the color of the veneers, but try and paste is a little more adhesive, uh, a little stickier. So when you place it in the veneer and place it on the tooth, it's a little more retentive than when we were just using water. And this is important because during the trying phase, we're gonna sit the patient up, we're gonna let them look at the veneers and evaluate the aesthetics before we go to the final cementation. So these are the veneers on the model. And as far as try and paste, and we're gonna talk more about cements when we get to the cementation part in a second, but any number of different kits for veneer cements. And again, we'll talk about cements a little more in detail uh, in just a minute. But all of these kits are going to have uh, matching compatible try and paste. So when you get your porcelain veneer cement, be sure that you get the corresponding try and paste because the try and paste are dialed into being the same shade as the cement you're going to use. So if you use a shaded try and paste, you want the combat compatible try and cement. So the shade that the patient sees at try and is the same shade when you get done. So just be sure in your kits that you, if it doesn't come with the try and paste, that you're ordering the compar compatible try and paste to go with the cement system that you have. So this is a case that we started out with, and that is tried in with um, a translucent or clear try and paste. And at this point, maybe the most critical part of what you're going to do. At this point, we're going to clean off all the cement. And we sit the patient up and we hand the patient a mirror. And we let the patient know these are just sitting on there. You can't move around. You can't talk too much. But take your time and evaluate them. Because I will not cement a veneer into place until the patient has looked at them and approved them and given me the okay to go forward. So you want to spend a lot of time at this point letting the patient look around, move around, move in different lights. Um, I've had some patients that have walked out of my office, gone outside to the sidewalk with a mirror because they wanted to see what it looked like in natural light versus the light in the office. Um, but it's okay because at this point, if there's anything the patient doesn't like, we can make changes easily. Okay, if we cement these into place before the patient's approved them, and then the patient sits up and says, whoa, you know, I don't like this. What'd you do here? I hate this. You know, now it's a really uncomfortable place to be because once they're cemented into place, you know, <clears throat> it's a long road to, to cut those off and re-impress and get new ones made. It's a very uncomfortable situation for everybody. So you want to give the patient time to look at them. And personally, my, in my practice, I walk out of the room, leave the assistant in the room with the patient because I don't want my presence in the room to be influencing their opinion. And when I try them in, I really don't go into a whole lot of detail. I'll just, about how I feel about them. I'll try them in assuming I, I mean, sometimes I'll try them in and they're so off. It's like, I'm not even showing them to you, they're going back. Doesn't happen often, but it happens. But I'll put them in the place and I'll clean them up and I'll say to the patient, you know, Mary, I think these look really nice. I'm gonna let you have an opportunity to look at them, evaluate them. I'll come back in a few minutes and you give me your critique. Because again, my physical presence in the room may influence somebody that doesn't have a stronger personality to say, oh, well, I don't wanna hurt his feelings, you know. I don't, I don't want that to interfere with this evaluation. I leave the assistant in the room because I don't want the veneers falling on the floor and breaking, um, but also for the assistant to get some feedback. And for the assistant, sometimes we'll have to describe, well, we had to do this here, we had to do that there, um, but to be a very positive influence during that part. Um, but again, I remove myself from the room. So I'll come back in five minutes, 10 minutes, whenever the assistant says we're ready. 
and I look at them with the patient. If they have critiques, things that we can change, some, th some things I can change after they're cemented into place. Some things the patient may want are so far off that we have to go back to the lab and we're gonna have to put the patient back in temporaries. In the lab, we have to communicate with the lab the changes we need to make. And that's fine if that's what we need to do to make the patient happy. Now, once in a blue moon, there are some patients that you're never gonna make happy and this part gets really challenging. Um, but a vast majority of the time, well, I would tell you probably 80%, 90% of the time when I walk out, walk back into the room, the patient says, I love them. They look great. Let's put them in. 5% of the time, the patient will say, well, I don't like this. Don't like that. Okay. We got to send it back to the lab um, and we can get those changes made for you. Uh, but I'd rather do that and have the disappointment on my side and the patient side of being back in temporaries for a couple of weeks versus having them cemented into place and having that very uncomfortable conversation of the patient saying, I don't like these, what'd you do? We got to get those off right now. Um, it, it's just an uncomfortable position you don't need to put yourself in. So this phase right now, just really take your time, be patient, communicate with the patient, make sure they're happy before you do the final cementation. And on my end, the last thing I do before I get ready to cement these in, once the patient approves them, I've got a piece of paper that I make the patient sign. And that piece of paper says, I, Mary Smith, have had an opportunity to view my veneers before they're cemented to place. I am happy with the aesthetics and give Dr. Rad's permission to cement these sign date witness, okay? So that's really important because that, that transfers the ownership of the veneers from me owning them to the patient owning them. I tried them in, I let you look at them, you had lots of time, you were able to give me feedback, you've agreed that you like these, you've signed a piece of paper, I'm gonna put them in like you requested me to do, now you own them. And if they come back later and say, well, I don't like this, don't like that, you know, now we have something to refer back to. Um, and it's not necessarily a legal document, but it's just rather um, developing a level of commitment on the patient side. It's like you had an opportunity to express your opinion. We gave you as much time as you needed. You know, you can't come back and tell us later you don't like them when we showed them to you before they were cemented into place. It's just a really good CYA thing to do. Uh, so I would encourage you to do that. And again, it's just a simple piece of paper, patient's name, had an opportunity to view them. I love them, give permission, sign date witness. Okay, so we've gotten to the point where we've removed the temporaries. We have cleaned the preps. We have tried in the veneers. The patient has approved for these to be cemented in the place. Now, really critical part of this is the preparation of the ceramic to be able to cement the veneers into place. So a couple things we need to do here. So we're gonna first remove all the veneers that were tried in, we're gonna remove them and set them out individually. Inside the veneers, there is the try and paste, but also there's the organic material that's in everybody's mouth, okay? And that material has also been introduced to the ceramic during the try and phase. And if you do like I do, and you give the patient lots of time to look at these, they're talking, they're moving around, saliva's moving in and out of all these veneers that you have temporarily sitting on the teeth. So there's a lot of contamination on your ceramic. So the internal aspect of your veneers need to be cleaned out. So a number of ways of doing this. One of the old school ways was you would uh, put the veneers in alcohol and put it in the ultrasonic for 90 seconds. 
Okay, that works, did it that way for a long time. Another way, the way Dr. Nash trained me to do this a million years ago, is we would use phosphoric acid on the internal aspect of the veneers, not to etch the porcelain, because phosphoric etch will not etch porcelain, but phosphoric acid is a really good detergent. So for a long time, I would use phosphoric etch on the internal aspect of the teeth, 30, 60 seconds is all it needs, and then we'd rinse that out and dry it. Nowadays, there's some specific materials, solutions that have been developed to maximize the cleaning of the inter internal aspect of porcelain. So IvoClean is a very popular one that Ivo Clark came out with. Many people are now using that, um, specifically developed for this purpose. Another product that Bisco has is called ZerClean. Bisco developed ZerClean for, uh, specifically for zirconia because zirconia can get very easily contaminated and bond strength is significantly uh, impacted if you don't get all that organic byproduct out of the internal part of, uh, of zirconia. But what they found when they were developing the material is that it works just as well on ceramics. So in an effort to be efficient in our office, because we do do a lot of zirconia, uh, but we also do a lot of all ceramic, we do a lot of veneers, uh, we just use uh, the Zerclean product for all. So now to me, it doesn't matter which one you use, but I would encourage you to use one of the two. And there's probably other products out there, but these are the two most popular in the market. And then I think I got a little video showing you, yeah. This is how we'd use the zero clean on a crown. Pretty simple stuff. All right, so, I mean, you can see how simple that is. Just apply the material, sit 20 seconds, rinse it off, dry it off. Okay, so now the internal aspect of the veneer has been cleaned off and decontaminated. The last thing we do before we deliver is we are going to resilinate the veneer. Most veneers you get back from the lab have already been phosphoric etched and have already been silinated. Okay, you need to be sure of that. So you need to talk to your lab because if they aren't etching and silenating in the lab, you need to know that because there are some other steps you'll have to do in the operatory. But a vast majority of labs nowadays, every lab I've ever gotten a veneer from, they've already done the phosphoric etch and they've already silenated in the lab. So for me, and it may be overkill at this point because the silane has already happened in the lab. I'm going to resilinate the veneer. It's a simple step. It takes another two minutes. And if it increases the bond strength even five or 10%, great. I'll take advantage of it because it doesn't take that much time and the product is fairly inexpensive. So with Bisco, their silane is you've got. Um, it's a two bottle system. You'll mix those together at the time of, right when you're getting ready to apply. So one drop, one drop, and then I'll use a micro brush as opposed to a dropper, but I'll use a micro brush on the internal aspect of the veneer, place the silane, 30, 60 seconds is all it needs. And then you air dry, air thin, air dry. Now the veneers are ready to be cemented. So 
The next step is where things get really interesting and get a little tense in the operatory, but this is where all the veneers are put into place. And because we have time limits, our cements only, our cements will start to set up after a certain period of time. So we're on the clock uh, when we do this. Now, when I deliver veneers, um, I was taught a long time ago by Dr. Nash to do multiple veneers at a time. Um, I know there's differing opinions on this. Some clinicians like to do one veneer at a time. Some like to do them two at a time. Uh, Dr. Nash taught me a long time ago. Um, if we're doing six veneers, we put in six at a time. If we're doing eight, we're gonna put in eight at a time. If we do 10, we may do 10 at a time, or we may do canine to canine, and then the two premolars and the two premolars. Um, but we're gonna place multiple veneers at the same time. And Dr. Nash's reason for that way back then that Dr. Rosenthal uh, confirmed many times over, if you try all the veneers in at the same time and they all fit, when you go to cement them into place, if they all fit at try in, they're gonna fit at delivery. What can happen when you try, when you cement one or two at a time, is you cement the first two veneers. Let's say you put in the both the centrals at the same time, which is a very common practice. You put the two centrals in and you clean them up. Now you get ready to put the laterals in. And the laterals, you're cementing them into place and they kind of just squeeze into place, but you get them there. You think they're fully seated. But now you go to put the canines in and all of a sudden the canines that fit at the try-in don't fit when you're doing the cementation. What we believe happened is when you seated the centrals and the laterals, they weren't 100% fully seated and they may have rotated just a hair, not that it'd be visibly noticeable, but enough to move a height of contour to make a contact height and to push the next veneer over a little more distally. And then that error gets compounded the further you go back to the point where a veneer now doesn't fit. So if you put multiple ones in at the same time, if they fit at try-in, they're going to fit at delivery. So that's the way I was raised doing this. Um, that's the way I've been doing it for 25 years. Um, and it certainly works. It works well. It is stressful. Um, I wouldn't tell you that it's not. Uh, and you need to get a good assistant. I mean, your assistant has to be right on top of it because you, again, you're on the clock, your cement's gonna start setting up. And if you're gonna put in eight or 10 veneers at the same time, you gotta be moving. And she's got your assistant, he or she, um, they've gotta be ready to go at, at a pace that's appropriate with the uh, time it's gonna take the cement to start setting up. Um, but if you do it this way and you get comfortable this way, then it starts to become automatic and your veneers will always fit. And you're not halfway through cementation trying to adjust a proximal contact on a very, very thin veneer, uh, which is incredibly stressful. Um, so the technique I'm gonna show you is delivering six veneers at the same time. So first thing, isolation. Critically important, uh, whether it's a rubber dam, sometimes we'll use orthodontic retractors if the patient's well-behaved. Uh, if the patient's got a tongue that's moving around and gonna get in the way and contaminate my bonding, then we're just gonna put a rubber dam on. Um, but whatever's the appropriate way to isolate that patient, to keep everything clean, that's what we're gonna do here. So in this particular case, we've got a rubber dam in place. Now, <clears throat> When we go to cement, we are going to use a total etch technique. Pour some veneers are thin enough that a vast majority of the two structure you're bonding to is going to be enamel. Etched enamel is the best surface to get the highest bond strength on. And with veneers, we want the highest possible bond strength for our cement, for our veneers. So we're gonna use a total etch technique. Now here, 
on the bottom right, and go back to my pointer, uh, we're placing the phosphoric acid on all of these teeth. We're gonna let it set 15, 20, 30 seconds. Uh, the length of time that the acid is on the teeth is really not critical because there's very little exposed dentin. Um, and enamel is not as sensitive to phosphoric etch as dentin would be. So the time component here isn't as critical. So we're going to etch all six of these teeth at the same time. And then we'll rinse and we'll lightly dry. And now we need to talk about bonding agents. So we've done the etching. The teeth are ready to accept the bonding agent. Any number of different bonding agents that work with a total etch technique are appropriate. Um, these two bottles up here, this is a fourth generation bonding agent by Kerr. Uh, there's a number of different fourth bond generation bonding agents still out there and they still work. Uh, they're just not as popular because they're a little more time intensive. However, they have incredible bond strength. So this certainly is an option, but unless you're old like me, a lot of you don't even know what this is, have never even seen it. Uh, what I used for many, many, many years were fifth generation bonding agents. Uh, so this is Prime and Bond, which is a dent supply product, uh, all bond to uh, by Visco. Um, OptiBond Solo was Kurs, 3M had theirs. Everybody had a version of a fifth generation bonding agent and they're still out there. Um, but I had years and years, 10, 15 years of success with fifth generation bonding agents. <clears throat> the last three or four years, I've transitioned over to doing all my bonding with universal bonding agents. So All Bond Universal was one of the first universals on the market. Now, many companies have universal bonding agents. But I like universal bonding agents because whether I'm total etching or selective etching or not etching, in one bottle, I've got the bonding agent I need. And then depending on the clinical situation, whether it's a class two composite or a veneer or a posterior crown, whatever I'm doing in that one bottle, I've got the bonding agent I need. So the last three to four years, I've just transitioned completely over to universal bonding agents. And I've had great success with doing my veneers and, and all my other bonded procedures using universals. Okay, so top left, we've etched all these teeth, we're rinsing off the etch, and then we're lightly gonna dry. And now we're applying the bonding agent as per the manufacturer's instructions on the preparations. And then we're gonna air thin and light cure here. Now cements, we'll talk a little bit about cements before we go to the technique. Any number of different composite resin cements that you can use to cement veneers with. There are dual cure options and there are light cure options. Now, porcelain veneers are thin enough that you can use a light cure composite resin cement and your curing light will go through the veneer and set up the cement. The other option is to use a dual cure. So whether it's a varial link or dual link or any of the 3M lines or the Kerr lines or the caulk lines, <clears throat> any number of different companies make dual cure resin cements. On my end, I was raised when I practiced with Dr. Nash to use light cure resin cements. And I've just consistently done that over time. My experience with light cure resin cements is I've got a little more working time than I do with dual cure resin cements. So I like them for that reason. But the other issue is dual cure resin cements have a reputation of shade shifting over time. Many companies have addressed that and many companies say they have overcome that issue. Um, I don't wanna leave it up to chance. If the veneers are thin enough, I can get light through it to cure, then I'm just gonna use the light cure resin cements when I do my veneers. So 
you do have the option. It is very much personal preference at this point. If you're more comfortable with a dual cure or you don't want to carry a specific cement just for doing veneers because you don't do a lot of veneers, I understand that. And you can do this technique with a dual cure resin cement. Totally fine with that. Um, but for my practice, I do enough veneers that having a kit specific to doing veneers makes an awful lot of sense uh, for us to use. So you have options here to, to choose from, but if you're asking me, I'm going to go to a light cure resin cement. And then while we're talking about cements, we need to talk about using cements to alter the shade of veneers. And I would tell you 90 to 95% of the veneers that I cement in the place, I use a translucent or clear cement. I don't want the cement to be what I'm counting on to alter the color of my veneer. I want the color to come from the porcelain, not from the cement. If the color is coming from cement, it tends to deaden and take some of the lifelike quality out of the veneer. And that's not what I'm looking for. So I do keep um, tinted cements in the office. I do have the ability to use them. Sometimes if you have an endo tooth on an eight or a nine and you've got to match these other teeth and there's a significant difference going to an opaque cement next to that endodontically treat, treated tooth can get you to that color that you really need. But ultimately I'm relying on the ceramist to make those color changes. So um, that's kind of my take on using tinted cements. I just, I'm not a big fan. That being said, I still carry them because every once in a while I do need them. And when you need them, you need them. And, and I want to have them available. Um, and the other thing about cements that I want to make very clear uh, before we get off the subject is the self-edged, self-adhesive cements are not appropriate for veneers. They're great for many other things, all sorts of crown bridge work, um, but they are not intended for veneers. If you read through the manufacturer's instruction for use, they will say it's contraindicated for veneers. And the reason is right now where the chemistry stands, and this is across the board, doesn't matter about which company it is, the bond strength, of these self-edged, self-adhesive cements is not adequate enough to hold veneers predictably into place. So even though these are great materials and they're very simple to use and it would make life a whole lot easier when you're delivering veneers, if uh, we could use these materials right now, we cannot. Um, so be very, very sure uh, that you're not trying to misuse these cements for purposes they're not intended for. Okay, use them to cement your crowns, great. Put in your bridges with these things, that's awesome. Um, just don't use them for your veneers. Okay, so we've etched, we've placed our bonding agent, we've light cured the bonding agent. Now I'm taking a clear translucent light cured resin cement, and my assistant will be loading that into each of the veneers, handing me one at a time. I'm gonna start with the centrals, get those to place, and then quickly move to the laterals, and then move to the canines. Now the cement, I've not light cured the cement yet. This is a real important part of when you're cementing multiple units at the same time. You need to clean up as much uncured excess cement as possible before you light cure. So you can see on the top left, the first thing I'll use is I just use a cotton roll and going from the porcelain to the soft tissue, I am removing the gross excess of cement. And I get it off as much as I can. And then on the bottom right here, now clinically, if I'm doing this, I'm holding those veneers to place with my fingers. So I'll hold the two centrals to place while my assistant takes a brush and removes even more, Whoop. sorry, 
and she'll be removing even more excess than that. And then I'm gonna hold those veneers to place with my fingers. And I'm sitting here with my fingers trying to touch the screen. I'm gonna hold the eight and nine to place with my fingers and right on top of the papilla, get my pointer back. She's gonna light cure right here for five seconds. And then I move my fingers here and here and she'll light cure here for five seconds. And then I'll come over here. She'll remove that little bit of cement. I put my fingers here, here. She puts the curing tip right here, cures for five seconds. And we go back and forth and back and forth, whether it's six or eight or 10. And we repeat, repeat that process, getting off as much excess cement as we can before we do the final light cure. So once we've tacked all these to place, now my assistant will come back with a curing light from the facial and the lingual and we'll light cure each tooth veneer for 60 seconds each. And once she's done that full light cure, then she'll remove the rubber dam and the clamps, rinse everything off. And now our final step will be getting rid of the excess cement in our finishing and polishing. Okay, so the gross excess cement, we've gotten that off before we like here. Now your armamentarium for cleaning up is going to be these next three things. Now the challenge of using this multiple unit cementation technique is <clears throat> initially when you're done light curing, you have fused yourself. I mean, right now I've got a six unit veneer bridge because in approximately there's cured cement, I've got to get it out of there. But if I get enough of it out before I light cure, it's only a thin layer and we can always get that out. So I want to walk you through those steps. Okay, before we get to here, the first thing my assistant will do, well, we would have the rubber dam off. I'm ahead of myself on this picture. So before we get to this picture, what we would do is I would take a fine grit diamond burr. I'll show you these in a second. A fine grit football shaped diamond burr and I go to the lingual. And where the lingual margin is where the porcelain touches the tooth, there's gonna be some excess cement there. Using a water spray and a fine diamond burr, typically those have red stripes on them. I'll go onto the lingual and I'll get rid of all the excess cement there. And then the next thing I'll do, and again, this slide's out of order, I'm gonna take a pointed fine grit diamond, again, with a red or a yellow stripe. I'll show you those in a second. And I'm gonna go around the facial margin over to the papilla and using a water spray in my loops, I'm gonna get rid of this excess cement and this little bit that's right at the margin and this excess cement here in here, in here. And I wanna use a water spray while I'm doing this so I don't scratch my porcelain at the margin, okay? So fine diamond with the water spray. You can see right here, just a little bit excess cement. And this comes off real easily, okay? So we're gonna get rid of that stuff that we can see with our loops. And then the next thing we'll do, we'll go back, is a number 12 scalpel blade. A brand new number 12 scalpel blade works great right here at the papilla and then helps you carve down this interproximal area. Damn it. You can carve right through the cement. It's this thin layer of cement on the interproximal area. Okay, so on the facial and the lingual, brand new number 12 blade, number 12 scalpel blade helps get rid of that. Once I've done all of that, now, I can go in with this serrated blade. Okay, now what I really like, what I use all the time is something called a Siri saw. This is a Denmat product, but this blade with these little serrated edges mounts onto this handle. And this makes it very easy to pop through these interproximal areas. Okay, so step one, a fine diamond burr with a water spray, going around all my margins, 
Then a scalpel blade, get rid of the excess right here and right here. Step three, taking my series saw and popping through. Okay. Now, once I've used that series saw and I've gone through all the interproximal areas, I'm checking all the interproximal with floss. I'm probably getting a little bit of shredding and that's excess cement I need to get off. To get that off, I use a diamond finishing strip and these are made by Comet, but Brassler and Axis also make these. But I'm using a fine diamond strip like this to go interproximal to get rid of any excess cement interproximally. So I keep checking with the floss and removing excess cement with these fine diamond burr or fine diamond strips until the floss comes in and out without shredding. Then when all the interproximal areas have opened up and I'm not shredding floss, I'm gonna polish that area with aluminum oxide finishing strips. And these are the Epitech strips made by GC, coarse, medium, fine, extra fine. And I go through all four strips. Just like you polish your composite with multiple polishing points, disc, whatever it is, same thing here. I'm polishing the porcelain composite enamel interface with these polishing strips. And then when I get done in all those interproximal areas, floss easily just goes in and out and in and out without shredding, which is critically important to prevent recurrent decay and to have excellent soft tissue health. So this finishing phase, this takes longer and you need to be patient. You need to work your way through it and be meticulous about it because the real challenge I'll tell you is patients will, the veneers are in place and the patients are done. They're tired. They want to go, but you got to pay attention to this part to finish it up. These are the finishing burrs when I was talking about earlier. And then these are the polishing discs. And then the last thing we do before we let the patient leave. Now we have checked and adjusted the occlusion and I don't have time to get into that, but you guys are all smart enough to know that one. Um, the last thing we do is we're gonna polish a 30 fluted carbide dry. So all those marginal areas on the facial, you initiate the polish with a 30 fluted carbide, but use it dry, not wet. That won't cut the porcelain, but it'll start to polish it. And then we're, <clears throat> and then we're gonna use a porcelain polishing paste in a profi cup in those margins right down by the tissue, we're gonna smooth and polish using that. And when we get done, these are the six veneers at a two week post-op. And you can see how healthy all the tissue looks. Floss comes in and out of here without shredding. Uh, at the post-op, we're also verifying and checking the occlusion to be sure that's okay. And then we end up with this. So that is a 60 minute sprint through um, the technique that takes me about two hours to do if I was doing that on six teeth. Um, but it's worked. I've done it for an awfully long time. Um, many of these things I had to do, I do by habit. I had to actually sit down and write down and think when I was going through the steps to present to you guys, because some of it has become so automatic to me over time. Um, but it's automatic to me over time because it's been predictable. It works. And I've got 25 years of veneer cases out there where I'm seeing a lot of long-term success on them. Um, and it's all really going back to basic principles I was taught 25 years ago. And I just refined, reinforced, and, and perfected over the years. But if you follow through these steps and you're working with a good ceramist, uh, I can promise you that you're going to see really good success over time. I'm going to jump up here quick to the questions and answers, but I'm going to leave on the screen my email address. Um, I was hoping to get done sooner, but uh, I also want to be sure I covered all these points completely. So email me if you have any questions. I'm going to just jump up here and see if there's something big I missed. 
Is it contraindicated to place bonding agent on the veneer or the ceramic? No. Uh, many people actually do that technique. I don't teach it because it's an extra step. But if that's what you're doing, that's absolutely fine. Are you confident the cement is fully cured? Some say remove minimal excess day of insertion and remove aggressively at the follow-up visit. Uh, Stephen, I am very confident it's fure, fully cured. I check my curing lights <clears throat> to be sure I'm getting um, good output. And uh, I'm using thin veneers, so I'm very confident that the cement's fully cured. And I would rather clean up the excess cement on the day of insertion while the patient is numb as opposed to when they come back and they're not numb because that can be uncomfortable or I have to numb them again. Um, so I try to do as much that day of, but uh, if, you're, if you have good curing lights that you're continually testing, uh, I have no issue being concerned about whether or not my cement's fully cured. I'm very confident that it is. Uh, question about, can you use flowable composite to cement? Yes, absolutely you can. Um, my issue with flowable composite as a cement is they don't make translucent flowable composite or I haven't seen it. Um, and I like using translucent cements. So, but if I was in a pinch and the government was gonna shut me down for two months and my last patient needed a veneer and all I had was flowable composite, I would absolutely use it. So there's no problem with that. A uh, question about do you sandblast the preps before cementing? I do not, but there's absolutely no reason uh, why you couldn't do that. A um, lot of questions about temporaries and I would love to do a program on temporaries. Um, another question after silencing the ceramics, can you apply bonding agent to the ceramic? Yes, uh, I answered that one earlier. What's your opinion about using a vibrating device to thin out the cement prior to light curing? Um, I would not do that because I would be concerned the vibration on really thin veneers could potentially cause a crack in the porcelain. And I would not want to have that happen. Um, I would rather find a cement that has a viscosity that's low enough that I'm comfortable that my veneers are fully seated. So that's trying different cements until you get to one where you find a, um, a handling characteristic uh, that allows you to be confident that your veneer is fully seated in place. But I would not want to put a vibrating device on top of these thin veneers. You know, an Emacs crown, yeah, sure, I'd be fine with that. But um, these veneers are awfully thin and they can be fragile uh, before they're finally cemented to place. Uh, what light cure cement are you using currently? I'm using the Choice 2 by Bisco. Um, I've used the Vatique by DMG a lot. Uh, Varial Link by Ivoclar is used by many people. It's a market leader. Uh, there's a lot of good light cure cements out there. I'd encourage you to be using one where the handling characteristics are something you're comfortable with. And that's individual preference. What adjustments would you make after cementation? I did mention that briefly and didn't go into that more. Sometimes the veneers will be longer than the patient's looking for. Oftentimes the canines are a little more pointed than what the patient wants. So when we're looking at the try-in phase and we're evaluating the veneers, if the patient comes to me and says, well, I think the centrals are a little too long or the canines are too pointed or I'd like the laterals to be shorter than the centrals. Those sort of changes I can make after they're cemented into place. Okay, so I'm comfortable doing that. I don't wanna make adjustments before I cement them into place uh, because I might break the veneer. But after they're cemented into place, yes, absolutely, I can do that. 
Oh, here's a good one. Is there a reason not for not flossing before setting the cement to avoid issues with having to remove cement interproximally? Yes, a very, a very big reason for that. I'm concerned that if you take the floss, pass it interproximally before you set the cement, that you could dislodge or create a gap in the veneer and you could get a void at the margin, which would eventually lead to recurrent decay. Or even worse, if you're having trouble with the tissue and controlling bleeding, if a couple of drops of blood get in a void, now all of a sudden you've got a huge problem because that blood will um, oxidize over time. The iron in the blood oxidizes and you'll create a black spot. So even though this idea of flossing before light curing the cement initially sounds like a good idea because it makes the cleanup easier, the potential problems of, of moving the veneer and creating a gap or sucking some blood underneath the veneer um, I don't want to take that chance, and I'd rather work harder at removing the cement later. So I understand where the question comes from. I get it a lot, uh, but that's the reason why I don't do it. Right here on the screen is my email address, and I will be happy to discuss any questions you have on that email, and I'll start checking it tonight when I get back home from dinner. So with that, those of you that are still on, thank you for attending. Um, enjoyed sharing this with you guys and wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Stay safe, stay healthy.